evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Paul Tridley, and I have the honor to be the president of Sheridan College and to welcome you here tonight to this very, very amazing uh, talk uh, with a regional, state, and national treasure, Bob Crum. I've gotten to know Bob a little bit in the last couple of years through Mr. Anderson, Mr. Fakro, Mr. Aris, and it's been just a pleasure. A uh, special shout out to the faculty of Gillette College for coming on up and cheering in this. Special thanks to uh, Scott Newbold for coordinating this and the Life Sciences Foundation here for funding it. So I will turn it over to Mr. Fackrell. Hey. So I've got the honor of introducing this fellow who needs an introduction because he just told what he always tells is a great story leading up to everything. And he'll probably interject a lot more tonight as he tells <laughs> about the big horn then and now. Um, Bob has been a fishing guide for over 50 years and he's been guiding the big horn river. Cut it down to 40. That's 40? Yeah. 40. 40 years, 60 years he's been guiding. And uh, he's been a guide on the big horn since 1985. So he's got a lot of experience with this river that he's gonna talk about tonight. Um, a couple of stats about Bob. He's originally from Michigan, but he got wise and moved out west in his 20s. He earned a degree from West, uh, from sorry, not West, Albion College in Michigan. And then he went, came over to UW to earn his master's degree in zoology with an emphasis in wildlife management from the University of Wyoming. Um, Bob is a writer. He's a natural historian, as you can aptly tell from his stories, a lifelong instructor, and he's also a, a guide on the on the Bighorn River, as I've mentioned. Come on in, folks. Bob's written various books, including the Rocky Mountain Berry Book, numerous magazine articles for, and I have to read these because there are so many, the Fly Fisherman Magazine, Fly Rod and Reel, In Fisherman, American Angler, Fly Fisher, Fly Tire, Fly Fishing and Tying Journal, and probably his most heartfelt endeavor was writing an outdoor art, uh, article for the Billings Gazette, which he did for uh, uh, almost 40 years. Am I getting that right? 40 from, years? Uh, from 1981 to uh, 2018. 2018. Yeah, nearly 40 years. Bob is also an active member of the Federation of Fly Fishers, Trout Unlimited, Ducks Unlimited, and Pheasants Forever. Um, he's a renowned fishing guide, as I mentioned. He's guided on the Snake River, the Green River, the New Fork Rivers, in addition to also guiding on the Bighorn River for several decades. When he's not fishing or guiding clients or putting up with the likes of me and some other characters in this crowd, he uh, likes to further the cause of fly fishing, but also conservation. And, and you'll get to know this about Bob from tonight. He's, an, he's a natural educator, loves educating everyone, um, on all the subjects that he's so keen on, but especially on the Bighorn River. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Bob. <laughs> Thank you, Brady. Well, I, I guess uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just hit the ground running and hope that uh, I don't stumble. Um, <laughs> The, the Bighorn River uh, has become kind of like my um, my favorite place to, to fish. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've had a lot of people say, well, if you could fish anywhere, what would you fish? And I go, well, the Bighorn River. Mm -hmm. You know, the, it's, uh, it's pretty handy. It's pretty close. And, and uh, I... I first started fishing the Bighorn River um, off and on in oh, like 1983 and 84. And prior to you know my guiding on the Bighorn, I had, uh, as Brady pointed out, I had been a, a guide out of Jackson Hole on the Snake River and the Green and the New Fork. <clears throat> it, it, it just different waters and the first couple couple times couple three times that I fished the Bighorn River 
I got my derriere kicked pretty hard. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I was much more content fishing Piney Creek down here. Uh, uh, and I just couldn't see how anybody would go up and fish that Bighorn River. And it used to be that Piney Creek down here, uh, 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 downstream from the interstate, was administered by Texaco. And if you went to their headquarters uh, on uh, Old Lady 7 there, um, you could get a year-long permit, you know, trespass permit to, to fish Piney Creek. In. And I had just tremendous fishing on Piney Creek. I thought, why would anybody, you know, drive 90 miles when I can drive, you know, 20 and, and have some just excellent fishing? Well, things change, but um, in 1985, um, I resigned from the Wyoming Department of Environmental Quality. Um, I decided that I wasn't cut out to be a bureaucrat and uh, I have also suffered from foot and mouth disease. And so, uh, you know, when you, when you get the head of the division looking for your hide, you know, it's time to quit. <laughs> because, well, it's rather quit than be fired. So anyway, uh, and I had, um, Looked around, looked around, applied for some jobs and didn't get them. And I had met uh, a fellow who was an outfitter and uh, a shop owner, Mike Craig, and, uh, you know, and told him about my experience and stuff. And I had fished with him and he taught me a lot about nymph fishing. And uh, I, I learned that uh, the royal wolves and muddler minnows that I was using on the Bighorn River weren't worth a hill of beans and that the, anyway, that nymph fishing was the ticket for the Bighorn and he taught me a lot. Anyway, I asked him if I could guide for him and he says, well, you've got to get to know the river. So I, uh, I fished the river for about two weeks solid. You know, it was a tough job, but I, I you know, I rose to it. And Mike hired me on. Uh, one more story, and I'll. I'll uh, but my, I remember my first guide trip. Mike didn't want me to use my raft. I had an Avon red shank raft, which I used on the on the uh, snake and so on, and on the New Fork and Green. And he insisted on uh, my using a drift boat. Well, he lent me his. For my first trip and I anyway I I remember you know I had a single angler and I, I backed down there at After Bay and I launched the boat and handed him the bow rope and I says I'll be right back and, and uh, I parked my car and trailer and, and I get back and the guy has got this just kind of incredulous look and here there's about that much water in, the, in that drift boat. Well, I never had worried about uh, drain plugs in, in my raft. <laughs> so that was my my first guide trip on the Bighorn. <laughs> I had to bail that boat out before I could even go fishing. <laughs> but anyway, I just I just go it goes to show that uh, I, I uh, started off with errors, and I've been a comedy of errors ever since. But as I say, I, I, I've grown to love the Bighorn River, and it, it's a beautifully clean and clear stream, and, and it is just wonderful for smiles and enjoyment, and young people and old can enjoy, enjoy it. Uh, anyway, this is, if you've ever been across uh, the uh, causeway on Highway 14A, 
there's this sign up there and it's uh, you know it's talking about bighorn lake and you know 71 miles downstream is is a yellowtail dam and anyway what the yellowtail dam was completed in 1966 67 and you know one thing i learned about uh from the DQ and inspecting all the coal mines was that if you had any runoff, uh, if any of these mines had runoff, that they had to put a sediment pond to settle out the sediments. Well, this uh, Yellowtail Dam was um, an excellent, uh, well, it created Yellowtail or Bighorn Reservoir, which is a 71 mile settling pond. And anyway, the dam was constructed for flood control. That was the, uh, that was the number that was the number one reason it was uh, uh, made. Uh, you know, I'm like my, all my guiding buddies that think that the, that the, the uh, that river and the, the dam and everything else was just made for their fishing and uh, working enjoyment. But it was a major one was for flood control and then hydroelectric generation. You know, here we are trying to go for green, green energy and so on. You know, we've got a heck of a powerhouse in the uh, Yellowtail Dam and there are four turbines there. And then irrigation and finally recreation. Prior to the dam being built, the uh, flooding was a major uh, concern. In 1935, 37,400 CFS, cube, that's cubic feet per second, was going down the river. Uh, the most I've seen is about 20. But 37,000. So that pretty much that, that whole valley down through there was underwater. And flows at uh, exceeding 20,000 CFS uh, were in 1936 through 38, 1942 through 47, 1963, 1964, and 1965. First year of the dam, you know, they wanted to get that reservoir filled up and they, you know, they pretty much shut the gates and everything else. And they had 25,000 well, anyway, they had real heavy runoff, and they got a, a real test of their uh, overflow uh, tubes, and uh, and it was such that uh, caused cavitation, and they, they dang near lost the whole deal the first year. So, anyway, uh, consequently, in the following year, they came back in and did repairs and stuff, and it uh, has uh, stayed pretty darn well. Were those the springtime flows or just annual flows? No, uh, the peak flows. Peak flows. Yeah, and, and they usually occur in June. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Well, you know, the, the reservoir is full, formed uh, or backs up the confluence of the Bighorn and Shoshone rivers. And the draining the Bighorn Basin, uh, there is a lot of row irrigation in the Bighorn Basin and the natural I can't call a lot of that soil, but the, the material that's on the surface is easily erodible so that if there's any, any precipitation events, although there's a lot of that Bighorn Basin only gets four inches precipitation a year. 
So, but if they do get a gully washer, it, it really puts some of those clays into the river. There are approximately 4,000 tons of sediment a day going into the Bighorn Reservoir. That those 40, uh, 4,000 tons would be about equal to 40 of the coal cars that be in uh, uh, coal cars worth of, of sediment. So anyway, it, <laughs> uh, like I say, it, what has happened is that, like I say, the res uh, the dam created a, a wonderful settling pond, and in most years, all that sediment filters out. The, incidentally, the res uh, the reservoir is about a third full. That it, it, you know that that deposition of that sediment and stuff keeps working down, you know, and. Uh, so uh, they probably got another 50 years of use or something, but it's, it's not going to last forever. One of the, right after things really got going, uh, I think it was um, October 1973, there was um, uh, the Crow tribe decided that, you know, they, they didn't want all the whites coming in there and catching, taking all their fish. And uh, so they closed the river to non-Indians. Uh, and there was a period of time where you know, like I say, the river was just closed to, to uh, non-Indians. Well, there was a court case, and the one that my historian buddy, Paul Gordon, told me about uh, was that a member of the Montana uh, uh, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks Commission went down to, there was a, a, a state access site, uh, state of Montana, which is uh, where Bighorn Access is, or 13 Mile, whatever you want to call it. And so the state land, well, he went in there and he, he called the crow and told them that uh, he was going fishing and they they wrote him up, and I think they, they wrote him up. The, the, the crows contended that they owned the water for, for, one, uh, for one thing, and they, I think they charged his lawyer for trespassing. I, you know, it, anyway, it, but this case, the state of Montana took this, uh, you know, took this case, to district court and they won. Well, the Crow appealed, went to the appellate court and the Crows won. So the state of Montana went to the Supreme Court and in, uh, I, I believe it's March of 1981, the Supreme Court in a five to four decision, that's how close it came, five to four, held that Montana had, uh, had the right to manage the fishery, it owned the water, it owned the bottom of the stream. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, was, that was about the, the long and short of it. And uh, the, the Crow, were quite upset about that, but uh, 
anyway, <laughs> it, for us, it was a pretty good deal. But uh, the first few people that did float down that uh, reported a few bullets zinging over their heads. But, you know, yes? Does Bighorn flow north from the Bighorn Reservoir to the Yellowtail, or is it the other way around? I'm, I'm sorry. The river. The river it, flows north. It flows north. Yeah. So the the Bighorn Reservoir is, is down by Riverton and that area. The water flows through the canyon in yeah, Thermopolis the to Yellowtail. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, the, the Wind River comes out there uh, at Thermopolis and the name changes to Bighorn there at the wetting of the waters and it continues flowing north and uh, at Kane, uh, the old town of Kane, uh, you have the Shosh Shoshone coming in okay. and then it continues on north and it flows on and uh, eventually joins the, uh, the Yellowstone River at Custer. Okay, and goes on to the Yellowtail. Down. Uh, no. No, no. The Yellowstone then goes into the Missouri. Okay. All right. Thank you. Got to get my map out before I come listen to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, the, the, the only thing you have to put up with is that I am hard of hearing. So, you know, if, if I don't get your question right off the bat, you know, holler louder. But no, that's. Uh, and it's always puzzling to me too, you know, but it did. Yeah. Um, well, uh, you might have read uh, Sam Morton's book, I Where did. Rivers Flow North. That's what made me think of it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. So, as I say, all of a sudden people could, <laughs> whites could fish, nine. Indians could fish the Bighorn River, and that that uh, commenced in uh, oh, March, April, 1981, and it grew in popularity. And one of the tackle, uh, one of the first tackle shops to open up was the Bighorn Angler, and the the owner uh, of the Bighorn Angler was a good is a good friend of mine. Mike Craig, he was, he gave me my first job. <laughs> I sunk his boat. <laughs> but anyway, uh, and, and uh, Mike uh, owned and ran the Bighorn Angler. And one of the first guides he hired was just the, one of the most colorful characters I've ever met in my life. A guy by the name of Brad Downey. And, and Brad Downey uh, uh, seemed to have an affinity for a, a strange tobacco that smelled an awful like awful lot like a burning alfalfa. And, uh, and on most days you would see him when these old faded Hawaiian shirts and so on. But he was a tremendous guide with a, just a, just the riot sense of humor. Uh, and anyway, as I say, Brad was one of the first guides on the river, so he got to he got to name some of the the places on the river. And I, whether this was one that he named, uh, I think. Frank Johnson told me that the, the, the meat hole is below the first island uh, below uh, After Bay Dam. And Frank Johnson, who passed away three years ago, I believe, um, told me that some of the early anglers that came, when, when that opened up, it was a 10 fish limit and, uh, you know, uh, it was any angling technique. And there were anglers that came in and fished this hole where the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service had planted a bunch of cutthroat trout that were 
you know, four, five, six, seven pounds, you know, they'd grown to considerable size. These people were coming in and fishing with, with uh, bait and taking gunny sacks of trout out of there. And uh, they finally fished that hole out, but that's how I got the name Meat Hole. <laughs> well, a little further down on the river, this is still in the upper three miles, is this shelf here and it's called Dag's Run. Well, it was named actually after Mike Craig. Mike went in his younger day had blonde flyaway hair you know, and a ruddy complexion and had quite a resemblance to Dagwood. <laughs> and so, you know, it, it, he, uh, he was known uh, Dagwood sure uh, got shortened to Dag real quick. And so anyway, this was Mike's, one of Mike's very favorite spots and always find him there. So they named it Dag's Run. Well, the next spot down about oh, a couple hundred yards is called Five Dollar Hole. And now we get to Brad Downey. And as I say, Brad's one of the first guides there. And he, uh, <laughs> he had uh, these, uh, uh, he was approached by a, a, a fellow who had brought his own boat back, you know, back in 81, 82, 83, there weren't that many people fishing and, uh, you know, there weren't that many guides and, uh, you know, information was shared quite readily and stuff. Well, anyway, this guy had brought his own boat and he asked, uh, he approached Brad and asked him for a good place to fish. Well, Brad described the spot and he said, now, if you, if you do well, um, uh, there's uh, a, a certain rock and he, Brad, again, uh, described this rock and he says, Put a five dollar bill under it. So, and we, you know, this is 1982. Five dollars, <laughs> ten, <laughs> maybe even twenty nowadays. But um, and Brad's fishing the next day with a couple of guys, and they pull in. Brad pulls in. He walks over the rock and kicks it over, and there's a five dollar bill. So, <laughs> hence the five dollar hole. There, there's more to come. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm down another old quarter mile or so on. It's kind of a backwater, and it's called, uh, uh, I, I know it as Carl's Place. And Mike Craig liked to fish that, that spot quite a lot. And there was a, a big rainbow trout in there with one eye. <laughs> and Mike named it Carl. <laughs> and he caught it two days in a row. So anyway, instead of Carl's Hole, it's Carl's Place. So anyway, Carl's Place. And if we go on down and go past three mile, this is this was in high water. I, uh, but this is called Snag Hole. And again, back in 1985 and 82 and so on, there was a bunch of junk in through here, old stoves and rolls of fence and everything else. And it was, hence the name Snaggle. And then there's the drive-in or the Detroit riprap. You get down below three mile and uh, about a, a mile or so below three mile. And there is this line of cars that are rip wrapped in. This was put in response to all those high water years. This was the state of art of erosion control back in the 1950s and 60s. Wyoming Game and Fishers. <laughs> yeah, uh, over on the Green River below Fontenelle, a, a bunch of that. But anyway, the, they put these in, and the only thing of it is, uh, you know, it's kind of scenic and everything else. And they, the most recent uh, 
car in there was a 1952 old, olds mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, it this worked pretty darn well but if if the water ever gets behind there it accelerates the erosion so anyway uh, but it's kind of it's kind of scenic <laughs> okay you go down another oh half mile below the dead cars the the drive-in and there's this island here and a shelf and whatever and it has the acronym sba meanwhile back to brad downey well again 1982 83 in there and Brad was having a tough day. And Brad pulls in down here where this boat is, I, I presume. He pulls in and he says to his clients, oh, this is a good spot. We'll get fish here. And the guy says, we better or it's your ass. <laughs> Hence, SBA saved Brad's ass. <laughs> 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 okay, you go on down oh, another oh, short mile and you get to Corral Hole and that's on River Right. If you're, you know, looking downstream, it's on the right. It's one of those that uh, I always get a kick out of it. Sometimes I'll have people ask me questions that are just, you know, uh, <laughs> like one day, uh, a blackbird with red, red uh, patches on its wings flies, flies across, and, and this person, the definitely a city person, said, "What's that bird?" And I said, "Well, that's a red-winged blackbird. I wonder why they call it that." <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I wonder why they call it gravel. <laughs> Okay, uh, this is pipeline, and uh, oh, it's another couple miles below um, Corral Hole, and this is on River Left. There is a high-pressure petroleum pipeline that goes under the river there, um, and if you're floating, you might see a, a, a yellow pipe on either side, uh, definitely on the east side of the river. That pipeline comes up out here at Mead Creek, and then it keeps on going down to Evansville, and then keeps on going and terminates down at Sinclair. So refined petroleum products from Billings and Laurel uh, there at the, uh, that uh, the pipeline. I might add that before it was renamed pipeline, Brad Downey, at, uh, you know, that, that day that $5 hole got mentioned, pulls in here and the guys get out and fish and they had real good luck. And they, when they get back in the boat, they said, well, if that spot up there was worth five dollars. This is worth ten. Mm -hmm. So anyway, Brad had named it ten dollar hole, but it pipelines superseded. Mm -hmm. Go on down another mile or so, and come into twenty dollar hole, mm -hmm. and that's just above where the gray cliff starts. Well, Brad pulls in there. The clients get out and they had fabulous fishing. Of course, when they got back in, they said, well, if those two spots upstream were worth $5 and 10, this is worth 20. So anyway, $20 hole. Back when I started, I started in 1985. All, just about all the anglers wade fished and you use your drift boat or your raft or your your float tube or whatever just to get from hole to hole and you got out and wade fished the only time that you 
uh, fish from the boat that was when you were throwing streamers, usually in the fall, or uh, for hopper fishing, working the banks. And nowadays, I'd say the majority of the anglers on the Bighorn River, I'd say 75% and about 90% of the guides boat fish. They boat fish nymphs out of there and uh, they participate in the, uh, well, uh, sometimes uh, been referred to derisively as the whirling disease and where they float down a fade line get to the end of it, you know, and, and their clients have, have got their, uh, you know, they might as well be fishing with cane poles and bobbers, but anyway, you know, they, they, you know, they got their bobbers out there and they float that feed line. And, you know, if it, it goes under the you know, guide hollers at them and they lift up and, you know, and catch a fish. But anyway, they might repeat that, roll back up, and do it again and again, half dozen times. And uh, it takes away uh, uh, any of the wave fishing. And it also, uh, you know, if if I wanted to to work those uh, that water along the bank, you know, they're rolling right through it and stuff. So it just uh, it's it's vexing, but. Uh, <laughs> When I started, the, the uh, line of shore, the, the invertebrate du jour was the scud. There were just hundreds of scuds. I wish I had a better photo of it, but anyway, the, these are scuds. And what what is that? What? What is a scud? Uh, it's it's a, a like a, a freshwater shrimp. Okay. And anyway, uh, basically, it wasn't very complicated, and and really. When I when I started off, this is about the only nymph you needed it was a old size ten or twelve bighorn scud, pink scud. That that was the fly. Nowadays, uh, well, it was about ninety. I never saw a sow bug until about nineteen ninety four, and then all of a sudden they were the main invertebrate in the river. And the scuds just, they didn't disappear, but they were, you know, very uh, uncommon. Again, early on, and it, it uh, we do have some great midge hatches, but uh, this is, <laughs> this is some, uh, some midges, that you know, they're about mosquito size or a little smaller that accumulated in my boat. But that was early spring fishing. There were some wonderful midge hatches, and long towards the evening, you'd have the midges getting together and mating there on the water, and you'd have these midge clusters. And some of the clusters uh, would be all oh, as big as quarters. And Anyway, it was just wonderful evening dry fly fishing with something like a Griffith gnat. And in the 90s, there, it was just fabulous fishing pretty much for the whole decade. Um, there was enough water that they, they were taking, you know, water over the dam or whatever, 
and not running, uh, you know, they, they were, say, running, say, 4,500 cubic feet per second, or maybe 5,000. Well, it was more than what they could put through the turbines. Uh, they usually run about, um, uh, they have four turbines, and I think they, they run them at, at, um, at about uh, 600 uh, CFS through them. Anyway, if it's going through the turbines, it's well below the, the surface and the water's way cold. If it's coming off the surface, if it's coming off the surface, it's warm. You know, you can go out and swim in it. Well, if you mix those two, it's, it's nice. It's nice and comfortable. Incidentally, you know, the, uh, you, you mentioned I have a, a degree from the University of Wyoming. In my fisheries course that I took back in 1966, I was told and I read that the optimum water temperature for rainbow trout is 62 degrees. And anyway, they get the best growth rate, they're the healthiest and what have you. But anyway, so much of uh, back then we had water temperatures that got into the mid and upper 50s and, and lower 60s. When we have those high, uh, uh, higher temperatures, the growth rate in the in, in the trout in the river is four to eight inches. When we have cold, uh, low water flow, like 2,000 CFS, 2,500, the water never gets above, uh, um, and, you know, never gets below the low 50s. The growth rate is two to four inches. So, you know, that is one of the things, you know, that made the, that decade so good was that we did have warmer, you know, not hot, you know, once it gets above uh, oh, 66, you know, it, it's just, you know, it's, you start having it a little bit too warm, get to 72 and uh, it's curtains for the trout. Well, anyway, I have found out that the yellow sallies and the morning duns, uh, uh, pale morning duns, like that warmer temperature. And yellow sallies in particular, if it doesn't get into the uh, low to mid 50s in early July, uh, the hatch is delayed or maybe never really comes off. So, it, you know, that whole decade, basically, we had just fabulous uh, uh, yellow sally. This is a yellow sally. It's a, it's a small stone fly. It's, as a, an adult there, it's about that long. And this is a pale morning done. That's a beautiful mayfly. And again, it's about that long. In all mid to late May into June, we had great blue winged olive hatches. And it's, uh, it's a mayfly. It's a beautiful mayfly. Uh, I don't know. Again, I wonder why they call it. Well, this is <laughs> blue winged. It's a, a more of a dun uh, wing. But anyway, blue winged olive. And it, Wonderful mayfly hatch. And again, in the 90s, we had this black caddis hatch. And black caddis are just a, a little, little critter. They're about a size 16 caddis. And, but they can come off in tremendous numbers. And again, in the 90s, 
there were times I, I remember I ran into a, a friend of mine from Bighorn, Jim Roach, the other day. And all I could, and I said, after we got to talking, I said, Jim, I remember one day that I, that we went fishing that you can't, I, I, I photographed you and you, you were just covered with black cats. And uh, anyway, these black caddis uh, hatch in the late afternoon and then they'll fly off and then they come back to the water uh, along towards dusk. And I, I found out, it took me uh, probably four or five years before I actually observed these black caddis real closely, but the, the female black caddis doesn't have enough power in, a, in her ovipositor, in her uh, tail end, to break that surface film on the water. You know, uh, that water surface film is almost like a brick wall to an aquatic insect. It, it's, it's pretty hard for them to penetrate. Well, how the black caddis overcome that is that the, the, that female caddis lands on something protruding from the water and crawls down on that object and lays her eggs, you know, below the water, uh, below the surface uh, on the uh, on that object. So if you're out weight fishing in the evening and there's a black caddis uh, hatch going on and stuff and you'll come out and and there'll be just like a whole bunch of gelatinous green BBs on 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 your waders and uh, the thing of it is if you're in a drift boat or whatever uh, I've seen people that you know, may, you know, it's been, been a warm day and stuff, and they're in short sleeve shirt, and all of a sudden they've got you know 10, 20, 30 black cats crawling on their arms. And I've seen people just go friggin' mad. <laughs> I had one fellow who uh, I had the unfortunate uh, event of a, a black cat has crawled into his ear and it got down on his. Uh, uh, eardrum and beating the sweet. <laughs> and uh, I stopped, I had to stop at a lodge and we got some hydrogen peroxide foam that may be out of there. But anyway, black caddis can be really bad. The thing of it is, um, uh, after, now this is, this is one of my favorite type spots, you know, the caddis, can land in here, land in here, maybe even in here, lay their eggs, and then they let go. And they just float back up to the surface. You know, they're a spent caddis. And the trout will line up on these lines, uh, you know, on these lines of current. And, you know, they just, picking off these caddis as they rise back up. They're not going anywhere. They're usually stuck in the surface film. And they just, just have a ball in a spot like this. I had, um, whoops, wrong way, Corrigan. Um, I was gonna say I had, a particular hole uh, on down below St. Xavier Bridge in 1995 that uh, I went in there in the evening at dusk, about light like this right now. And uh, those caddis were floating along and, and you could see the fish rising. And uh, that, oh, in about three weeks time, I, I, we had, uh, my clients had gotten, uh, 
I think over 20 trout that were between 20 and 25 inches on dry flies. And it was just, just fabulous. Well, a little later in the season, oh, oh early, well, into se uh, early September into October, we have another hatch, and it's uh, called the, the, the trico hatch. And it's a small mayfly, about an 18 to 20. And it's called trichos because it's trichorithides. I don't know if you can see it. There's one, two, three tails. So that's trichorithides. And they're, again, uh, not the biggest mayfly in the world. But when you get clouds like that, you know, now the, now the mayfly, unlike that, uh, the caddis, the mayfly will come back and, uh, and after they've mated and so on as adults, mayfly comes back, the female lands on the water, spreads her wings out like so. So she's stuck in the surface film, but she'll raise her abdomen and see she's nice and planted and she can drive that her abdomen through that surface film and extrude their eggs and dies. But anyway, they're called spinners. And anyway, <coughs> hatch, uh, uh, the trichomes usually hatch at about six, six or so in the morning. And, you know, by that time in September and stuff, it's still dark. And uh, anyway, but there are people that want to be out there and fish that hatch and, and there, you know, the, uh, difficulties finding a spot to fish and everything else. And I like my sleep. <laughs> I, you know, like I say, those females are going to come back and land on the water. And once they get stuck in the water, they're not going anywhere. And the, the trout can just pick them off at leisure. So this is, you know, this is stuff that's, uh, you know, accumulated in the backwater, but that give you an idea of, of how thick that spinner fall can be. Well, again, in 1985, when I started off, I knew of one pelican on the whole river, and it was down just below the SBA on a little island called Pelican Island. And it had a hook in its pouch. And like I say, I think that was 1985. And then I went for several years and never saw a pelican. And then got into the Oh, late 90s or maybe, yeah, late 90s, early 2000s and stuff. Excuse me, early 2000s. And I started seeing pelicans. But they would be most of the time on the lower sections of the river from uh, uh, Bighorn to Mallards or Mallards to Two Leggings. Mallards to Two Leggings, I'd, I'd see the most pelicans. And nowadays, uh, I, I'm seeing pelicans uh, up in the upper three miles. You know, even in that stretch just below after bay, sometimes. And these pelicans, for the most part, are not are not afraid of people anymore. And I got to thinking. Like I say, I hadn't seen them, I hadn't seen them. And why did they suddenly appear? <coughs> well, uh, it, you may or may not know that the uh, invasion uh, of the lake trout in Yellowstone Lake decimated the Yellowstone cutthroat population in the lake. And dang near drove it to extinction, but uh, it has recovered uh, 
with you know strong efforts. But that's where those pelicans were nesting. There's an island in Yellowstone Lake called Pelican Island. And that's where those pelicans were. Well, if they, you know, if you don't have any food to feed the kids, you know, you're going to you're going to have to you're going to have to go places and do things. And I think uh, um, anyway, they 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 have taken up residence uh, in the. Uh, 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 Northeastern Molt, I think, over by Molt, Montana, on a, on a big uh, shallow lake there. And they'll fly in to feed on the Bighorn River. And they've, they've had some interesting effects because uh, pelicans team hunt. You know, I used to hate great blue herons because, you know, I catch it catch a trout or something and there'd be a hole through it or whatever. And uh, I just, you know, had taken my trout away and whatever or hurting my trout. But, you know, one thing I admire about a, a great blue heron is that it it's defends its feeding territory. You know, you know if, if you're ever out on the river and you hear the squawking and everything else, you might see one heron chasing another and you know, then the heron coming back and putting back down where he was feeding and stuff. They defend their pelicans team hunt. You might see you know, a herd like that. Uh, I've, uh, I think this one was actually uh, right along the gray cliffs. And Right where they are in uh, May, June is a, a tremendous area for rainbow trout spawning. And what those uh, pelicans will do is kind of form a, a J and uh, have, have uh, the lower ones down there fairly tight to shore and the other ones kind of coming up Anyway, and then they will swim towards shore. Well, the fish run ahead of them, and when they get close to the shallows and stuff, they go, oh, you know, and try and go back, and the pelicans will nail them. And they, uh, I, you know, for the most part, <laughs> I'd like to say, well, they're just being pelicans. Uh, but I, I do object when, you know, uh, they really come in and hammer the spawning areas. And, uh, they make it tough. Oops. Well, I do. Okay. Um, Quickly, between 2000 and 2008, uh, as you, you know, if you've lived here, you knew, know what the, we had a heck of a drought. And the flows in the river were diminished. And what ha uh, also, since they were those low flows, the water temperature didn't warm up much. And anyway, there was less area, you know, less water for the, the trout to live in. And uh, so that anyway, they ended up with fewer trout in the river. And like I say, the fish numbers declined, and there was some Yahoo that wrote for Fly Fisherman magazine that uh, declared uh, or asked the question, is the Bighorn River dead? And what had happened is that, you know, Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks uh, uh, do electrofishing there every year. And the first run through, to make it real quick and simple, they uh, measure and weigh 
and take a scale sample of a fish and mark that fish, usually with a little divot in its tail. Well, they wait a week and then they come back through and they, again, electrofish, and then they're just counting the number of marked fish or you know counting all the fish but the marked fish and, he, he, and they know how they should know how many marked fish are in the river and then anyway they can set up a ratio well they didn't recover enough marked fish to have a, st a statistically valid sample so they did not do an estimate and this guy uh, declares the Bighorn River dead. The cold water and stuff uh, infected the aquatic insects. Yellow sallies in particular, just you know, the hatches went to near zero. They need that, that water temperature up there to, to go. The sow bugs and scuds and aquatic worms became the basic food for the trout. And instead of four to eight inches a year, that cold water knocked it down to two to four. And again, 2000, 2008, low flows and stuff, what uh, silts and stuff were coming down were settling out. And anyway, many holes were silting in. Um, we had the recommended minimum flow uh, up until, well, anyway, it was 1,800 or 2,500, and they had flows 2,000, 1,800 some years. And they were actually concerned, I think, in 2007 that the river or the reservoir was getting so low, it's just about like down in Lake Mead, where they're worried about, uh, they were worrying about whether they'd have enough pressure to turn the turbine. <laughs> and it was that close. And about the same time, the Friends of the Bighorn River or Bighorn Lake in Lovell decided to get on their heels and, you know, because Horseshoe Bend Marina was high and dry and, the, you know, the uh, park service and uh, powers that be had promised some great tourism and stuff. And the folks from, from Lovell weren't getting any tourism, weren't getting to use Bighorn Lake, and they were pretty upset. And they they got on their high horse and uh, uh, they demanded that there be water held in in the reservoir so that they could boat out of uh, Horseshoe Bend. So things were gone down a bit. Well, anyway, this is the way this uh, things looked in 2007 at 2300. Uh, well, 2009, we got up to 13.3. And then in 2010, uh, 10,008. And anyway, uh, from uh, 2009, uh, on things started popping, but um, uh, up until then, uh, it was uh, really pretty tough. Now, this 2011 was really interesting. Um, and I'll show you. Uh, this is 2011 in May. And it got heavy rains on top of a snowpack. And the heavy rains also occurred for several days out on the plains and so on. The ground was saturated, got run off from every little cul uh, culvert, little rivel, uh, rivlet, uh, ravine, uh, anyway. And the, the water just came up markedly. This, this stream here, this is a Mountain Pocket Creek. And right now, if you go past Mountain Pocket Creek, it would be no wider than this chair. It's, uh, 
it's uh, well. The, uh, the last time you cross the canal, before you uh, uh, go up the hill where three mile is, and when you, you go across a mountain pocket. Anyway, uh, it was so heavy from the runoff on the plains and stuff that they cut back on the um, the flow from the dam, and they ran ran up into the flood pool within three feet of filling the flood pool. But um, fortunately, it saves the uh, bridge down on Interstate 90 at Hardin because it, it was up there around 21, 2200 CFS. So um, that was that. Now, anyway, this, these are peak flows to the present. Oh, God, I'm sorry. I... Okay, so in 2011, after things uh, subsided a bit, you know, there was all sorts of stuff washed in and everything else. The fishing was great. And fall trico fishing was, was pretty good. Here's some rising fish here. Well, here of late, uh, we had a problem that really affected things in 2016 over near Powell. The Will, uh, they, they were trying to do some uh, maintenance work on Willwood Dam on the Shoshone River. They had things drawn down a bit. And basically the Shoshone River was running through these mud banks that were, you know, several feet high, probably as high as the ceiling or, or more. And they caved into the river and you just had, well, I, I was reading a, um, uh, an excerpt of that in, in the uh, Cody newspaper, uh, you know, documenting that. And it, it wasn't, uh, uh, the uh, game and fish uh, fisheries biologist he, uh, said that it was more like a slurry than, than, a, than a sediment run. But anyway, ended up with a whole amount of all this mud and silt going down the, the Shoshone River, covering everything, killing a lot of the aquatic uh, life, fish, and uh, even suckers, you know. And a lot of the invertebrates, and and th and that uh, reached the upper e end of the Bighorn Reservoir. Well, in 2017, they had quite a snowpack and everything else, and they uh, ended up. Uh, they they drew down the, the river or the uh, reservoir a bit to accommodate this runoff, but we got flushing flows out of Buffalo Bill Reservoir, and we had about five miles of mud flats exposed because the river was uh, the reservoir had been drawn down so much, and then we had high flows in the Shoshone, high flows in the, in the in Bighorn River, you know, from uh, Wyoming. And anyway, ended up uh, having about 17,000 CFS coming into the reservoir. Well, these clay particles are real light and it doesn't take much current to, to, uh, to get them moving. And it almost has to be dead still before they'll settle out. And anyway, since they uh, had 
so much water coming in, they uh, they were worried about you know uh, overtopping the reservoir and stuff. So you know they were running a lot of water out, and so you ended up having a current through the reservoir, and the clay never settled down. Uh, and uh, anyway, that clay continued into the river. And also, uh, after Bay Reservoirs got a lot of silt in it, and there was just all this uh, heavy flow going through, and it really muddied the river. So you got a lot of, of the, the reservoir fish going over the spillway. And one of the, the uh, things that happened was that the uh, emerald shiners got washed over. There are just balls and balls of these emerald shiners that they planted in the uh, reservoir. Wyoming Game and Fish did that. Bill Witcher told me about that. Uh, anyway, but these emerald shiners put them in there for the walleye. And uh, anyway, they, they were washing down. They had brown trout washing down, walleyes washing down. And in, anyway, it was uh, quite the deal. Uh, there are some <laughs> pretty messed up emerald shiners there. This was a trout that we found that had washed over and, you know, uh, dropping maybe a uh, hundred feet or so. That does, it's pretty rough on the fish. <laughs> and I had an angler catch a walleye <laughs> in the river. And, you know, in, in August, and I'd never had that happen before. And then paddlefish, which are, you know, they're uh, filter feeders and so on. And the water temperature was such that the paddlefish were moved all the way up there to the SBA, you know, within five miles of after bay. And anyway, those high flows in 2017 washed out the blue winged olive hatches and didn't have much for midges. Uh, and since the water temperature was so warm and everything else, all the hatches were kind of thrown off. But the uh, black caddis, like I say, that normally started in late July and ran through August into uh, September, started in the upper three miles in June. And the trichos started in July. It was really uh, mid to upper 60s in late June. <laughs> really strange. And the thing of it is, the water remained murky all year. Well, trout need to be able to see. And when you only have about that much vision, you know, about a foot of visibility, you know, and, you, and you're trying to find insects that are a uh, quarter inch or less long, uh, it's pretty tough sledding. And uh, of course, with all that, there was probably a lot of nutrients, the wigeon grass really went. Uh, and, uh, but finally, the flows dropped enough where uh, finally the, there was more, uh, a, a greater proportion of water coming through the turbines. So the, the little colder water and the temperatures went down. But this, is, I don't know if you can see, but this is gray water. This is in August. It should be just you know, gin clear. Okay, this was a September brown trout. He's mm. got about a month or two before he spawns. And the, the, the girth, you know, look at there. The guy's got, you know, can put his hand around that. that. There's no girth to it. The, the fish just weren't in shape to spawn. And then we had the forest fires and stuff, and it was just not a fun time to be on the river. And they had weed islands that came floating down. That, uh, 
all approximated the Queen Mary. <laughs> Even the whitefish were scrying on. Well, what happened after uh, 2017? We got all that clay out of the sea, uh, out of there, and the waters cleared up, and the fishery rebounded. The fish could see, and they fed heavily. And really, uh, things have just turned around markedly. Uh, the fish had great growth rates in 2018. And 2019, 20, 21 were excellent as well. And we ended up having some of the greatest pale morning done mayfly hatches uh, that I've ever seen. And Brady was with me on, on one of them, uh, one of those days. But the fish could, uh, uh, they just grew and put on a lot of girth. And all of a sudden, they were just tougher and all get out. Uh, uh, up until then, I very seldom had fish break me off. I had fish break me off bend out the hooks, break the hooks, uh, you know, they, they just, it was just like somebody had come in and, and uh, put a super gene in, in those trout. And but what this, happened, I'm sorry, what happened in 2018? That was the turn of events? Yeah, well, what happened was that all that murky water, all the clay and stuff had, had gone through the system. So instead of the, the visibility only being about uh, all eight, 10 inches, you know, it went to, you know, four, four five, six feet. Gotcha. So the fish could see very well. And this is, this is one of the, the uh, fish that... Uh, uh, like the a pale morning done, Brady netted this one for me. I I hooked that fish. Here's my boat up here. You're blocking. Kent was missing six fish above you. He can't see him. He's hiding behind you. Well, anyway, <laughs> the, but things have turned around, and the river is as good or better than what I can remember back in the nineties. This is my buddy Paul Dubas. You know, again, now this is a this is a fish in uh, September, and look at the girth on that. You know, they, they almost have a rough time getting two uh, hands over that. So anyway, I guess what I can tell you is that the good old days are here. You know? <laughs> Get out. Give that river a try. Mm -hmm. Thank you ever so much. Any questions for Bob? Okay. <laughs> Sorry to keep you so long. <laughs> Ken, tell us about the, the book that's in your pocket. What's that? Tell us about the book that's in your pocket. Oh, um, I when I when I guide, uh, I will um, write down the day uh, and the, the flow and where I'm floating. Uh, you know what what my uh, uh, put in and take out is what the flow is and maybe the water temperature and the weather conditions. And then when a person catches a fish, I measure it and, uh, and also mark what fly it took. Mm -hmm. So anyway, mm -hmm. and I've got records, I think back to 1995. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. What do you expect the river to do this year with all the record snowfall you run know, off? Well, the there's not, it's not a record snowfall. No. <laughs> no. No, we're only in, in the 
uh, in the Wind River, Bighorn uh, Basin, and Shoshone River, it's about 110 percent of normal. Hmm. Can't you can't you remember back in what was it 2011 uh, that when the, they went to open up Highway 14A? Uh, you know, they, they try to get 14A open by uh, Memorial Day. And I, I recall that uh, the snow was so deep along 14A that the rotary, all you can see is that, that chute there. But uh, no, uh, I, I think that this is, this is great. And, you know, and, and uh, the, the reservoir had been down a bit anyway, so... Uh, I don't expect that they'll run it now. See, they've got the flow right now to accommodate that runoff. They, they're running at 4,000 cubic feet per second. So they'll get it drawn down pretty good. And I, you know, 7,500 is, you know, I, I've fished it. Heck, I should have fished that 14,000, but <laughs> three or four. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the three off shot, <laughs> chucking and ducking. <laughs> yes, sir. Is it wall to wall boats there and fishermen? Um, it can be busy. Yes, uh, I, uh, I would say that if you, you know, if you get a chance, best time to fish like right now if you can go go during the week mm -hmm. go go and it's yeah. it's good fishing right now uh red midge larva uh soft tackle sow bugs um oh. anyway uh you know the nymph fishing is pretty good and uh, you can you can you can do pretty well right now and like I say, you might uh, run into the midge fishing in the afternoon and uh, evening. I, I like to go with a midge cluster uh, fly, uh, a high-vis midge cluster, and maybe a single uh, black midge behind it. During the day when the midges are coming off, I like to use that high-vis midge cluster and then a little zebra nymph uh, uh, underneath, and, and that's when I like to be casting from the boat, uh, you know, to those fish going after the emerging uh, uh, midges, you know, cast, okay, got a, got a fish rise here, and I would make my cast, you know, hey, my boat's moving, and that rise form's moving, so I, you know, so anyway, I, I have to compensate, but you know, say drop that in here, and by time yeah. you know uh, it floats in there, it, uh, they'll usually take that zebra midge. So May June is going to get more crowded, you would say, correct? I mean, it just builds for a while, or is it September, October? Is that a good time to go? There? <laughs> It used to be back in 1985 when I started off in, in September, October. It was you know you could see one or two other boats, and and nowadays even in October you're going to see oh 20 30. Yeah, I this is a strange thing. I don't I'll make it short as I can. I got out of the army in 1972, graduated from school in 74 because I'd been in college. And a friend of mine from Laurel, Montana, who was living in Billings, invited me out to be a, one of his groomsmen. And I, I want to say I thought it was like 1974, 75. And we fished either the Bighorn or the Little Bighorn. It had just opened up the the... Indians. Now, this, so you're saying the Bighorn closed in 74, didn't open till 81. Right. So, would the Little Bighorn have been a river that they opened up, or is that, is yeah, my yeah. thinking pretty the fuzzy? The Bighorn uh, runs through the reservation. Yeah. And it's, it's no bigger than, so you uh, know, it's no it. bigger than the tongue, say, at, uh, okay. uh, at I got uh, there. Dayton. 
okay, and, got it. And, and it never would have been. So I had to have been on the Bighorn when it opened. So maybe it was 81 and I've lost track. Yeah. Of That's a long time ago. And it just opened up. We took a John boat, went down about eight miles. And then there was a, I think he called it the Milk River that came in to, and it literally split the river in half. When half of the river was mud. Silt Creek. Silt Creek. Soap. Soap, Soap Creek. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I don't think there was a cast we made where we didn't catch a fish. Yes. And three pounds was small. Yeah. I caught a 10 pound yeah. brown in that yeah. sea. Well, then you were fishing yeah. right, after right after it opened. Yeah. yeah. Only time I've been, I've ever been on it. Yeah. So I just moved yeah. out here in September and I live in. Story. Well, like I say, now it, there are plenty, there's a, a good fish in there, but you have to work for them. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you.